Hey, good morning. Sunday morning. Looking forward to doing church with my family, my friends, and with you. And uh, just thankful to be here today. Just thankful for another opportunity to see what God has to say for us. Uh, let me just show you something real quick about the, what the Lord has taught me this week about church. And um, hadn't even thought about it in a while. I mean, I've, we've, we've all read the scripture. We've all looked at it. We've all read this when it comes to giving. But in Malachi chapter 3, it says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. You know, it's interesting that we live in day, living in some days where, you know, sometimes maybe finding a dozen eggs is hard to find or some milk or just some basic bread, you know. I mean, it, it's, we're still having it. But the more you listen to the news, the more you watch what's going on in the world around you, it makes people nervous and uh Every day when you listen to the news, they're showing you graphs and numbers and just overwhelming us with just seems like dread. And, you know, the, the our governor wants to, to slowly open up our, our state. And, you know, and, and I know that there's people that are freaking out and thinking it's too soon or whatever. And so there's just all this chaos in the, in, in the midst of everything else that's going on. And people still lose their jobs each week. And, and what I've learned is that if somebody has a full stomach, they have a little bit more calmness. They have a little bit more security, and especially if their kids can eat. And so when it says that there may be food in my house, I said, our church right now, I'm so thankful, has a ton of food. It's good. And uh, we're blessed to have, you know, not just canned meat, but packaged meat, frozen meat, refrigerated meat, fresh meat. <laughs> and uh, that's just because... We just want to be on the, the, the bottom line of what God is doing here. And I'm so thankful for Ned and David and all those that have been just coming around and just seeing what we're doing and wanting to be a part of it. Even people have brought us some of their stimulus checks, even though I hadn't got my stimulus check yet. Still waiting on my stimulus check. But it's been, it's been a blessing to just not even have to ask for people to do anything financially. It's just the Lord is just moving on hearts to do it for us. And we're so thankful and, and still and continuing going forward. If you know somebody that needs something, we're still wanting to, to be a blessing and help. If you have a neighbor, check on your neighbors. You might not be able to take care of them, but check on your neighbors and we can help maybe take care of them through you and be a blessing through you. And you know, that's just how it works. And so I'm just, I'm thankful for this opportunity. I'm thankful for a a church the size we have so we can stock it with food and thankful for the help that comes in and helps us do everything. Even Cece's been hanging out with us and doing our daily devotions, sticking around and helping bag flour and, you know, put eggs in 12 cartons. So we just want you to know we're blessed to be a part of what God is doing in the world today. Today we're going to read. We have my Bible. I get it. My bad. Today we're going to be looking at John chapter 2. Uh, last week, or a couple of weeks ago, we saw where Jesus turned the water into wine and uh, the, the, um, the, spiritual, the spiritual aspect of what he did last week and what he was trying to teach us about who he was. It would, it's interesting that his first miracle would be to bless a wedding with his presence, which is very important, man. A wedding is very important. We talked about that when, when Jesus did that. And, uh how he turned uh, the water to wine, how he wanted to be bring joy to the wedding. He wanted to bring joy to the to the people in that celebration. He wanted to be a blessing. And then he said that he saved the best for last. And he's teaching us that, you know what, if we'll do our part, no matter what we had in the front, our, our last can be great. And I'm so thankful for that. But today we're going to pick up where Jesus goes into Jerusalem for the Passover. And... Uh, and so we're going to pick up in verse 13 of John chapter 2. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables and he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. It's interesting that Jesus is coming into the temple 
right after doing the, turn, doing the first miracle, turning the water to wine, which was a sign for his disciples. And uh, as he goes into the temple, his disciples that are with him at this time are thinking it's going to probably be a joyous occasion going in. But when Jesus goes in on his way, he gets some cords, he starts stitching them together, and he makes a whip. And I'm sure the disciples are thinking, man, what's he about to do? And then he goes in there and he begins to just flip over the tables of the money changers. Now, you got a picture, the, the, and I should have shown the picture, but you should have, it, the, the temple itself had two large outward courts. The middle section was the Holy of Holies where the sacrifices were done, where only the priests and Jewish people could go. But the outside porch was where the Gentiles would go. This was where God made available an opportunity for Gentiles to come see and be a part of what the Jewish people were doing because the whole purpose of the Jewish nation was to draw in Gentiles and all those people in the world. And so what they had done is when you would go to Jerusalem during the Passover, you would have to take your animal. And if your animal was in any way scarred, maimed, or imperfect, uh, it couldn't be offered as a sacrifice. But what the Lord said, he said, take the, the first yearling, or one of the first lambs of, your, of your, your fold, and find the best one. What if the best one had a little marking on it? That was going to be your best one. But what happened is when they got to the temple, the priests saw an opportunity to set up a system by which they could fill their pockets. And that's why he's talking about making merchandise. And so... You would go to the temple, they would tell you that your sacrifice was no good, it was flawed, but there was some over here you could purchase. Well, by this time, many of us, how many of us, before we became Christians, used to sit on the couch late at night, and we'd watch those televangelists begging for money, and we would laugh, and we would mock them, and we'd go, you know what, Christians, all they want is your money. All they're doing is marketing, send in $5, $10, I'll get some holy water, you know, some blessed bread, or blessed this. Um, it just it just turned us off to Christianity. Well, this is what was happening during Jesus' day. The, the, the court where the Gentiles could go and worship God was a place where they were being taken advantage of. And so even before you could even buy a temple animal, you had to trade your money or change your money for temple money because the money you would bring usually was Roman money because that's what you had to use and had a picture of Caesar on it. And so the, the Jewish people, because they were so holy, didn't want Roman money in their treasury and so what they would do is they would change it for temple money. It may be, you know, you, you give them $3, they give you $2 worth of temple money back. And so they was getting you on both ends. And Caiaphas, who was the high priest at the time, he was raking it in. He would get a percentage of everybody's wares for being in the temple. And so he was, they said that he was one of the richest men in Jerusalem at that time. The priest, the high priest, who would go into the Holy of Holies once a year, for the Jewish people was a thief. And it seems like God let him get away with that for a while. But he's also got to be accountable for putting Jesus on the cross. And so I don't know which is tougher, you know, for him. But but as far as the uh, the money changers go, listen. Just so you know what the church is worth in America. A new analyst from Georgetown University, analysis from Georgetown University, that attempts to document the economic value of religion in U.S. society found that the faith sector is worth $1.2 trillion, more than the combined revenue of the 10 technology companies in the country, including Apple, Amazon, and Google. Think about that. How much money religion generates? That's got to be a big temptation for churches, for people, for ministers, for people to get in position who can recognize vulnerable people sometimes and then manipulate vulnerable people to get into their pockets. I watched a preacher the other day who's a multimillionaire getting up there saying, you better not stop paying your tithes during this pandemic. You think the virus is bad. Don't give to God. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? Wow. So there are millionaire preachers. This pastor Hillard, I don't know who he is, he asked this church for 52, and it's actually favored seed, $52 favored seed to upgrade his helicopter. Mm. Now, if you look at this one house, this is the pastor's house. I'm not going to tell you who he is, but he, he, he lives in Houston. 
God wants us to prosper financially, to have plenty of money, to fulfill the destiny He has laid out for us. I've never preached one sermon on money on just finances. I want to stay away from it. If you want to reap financial blessings, you have to sow financially. So I guess the kingdom of God is about financial prosperity. This study from religion also gives us and just tells us the same thing. So there's many articles out there. But check this out. This is what the Lord says in Isaiah. Also for the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. He's talking about the temple, the decor of the Gentiles. He wants to bring them in. He's trying to sound the alarm and draw us in. The burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, not just Jewish people, but for Gentiles. And so if you have the church merchandising the church, it turns off those that want to come to them and they feel put out. They don't feel connected to the to the Lord. There's some churches you have to pass a test to be a part of their church. It's hard to think about why would we merchandise? I mean, there, there's some churches that I, I just know I, I just know I, I know that what Paul says you know about some preach for this reason preach for that reason. I, I'll show that scripture in a minute but we have to understand that we are called not to poverty, but to be spiritually willing to give it all away, not collect it. This, this life right now, God is doing something in our lives. But what we want to make sure is we want to make sure that we don't merchandise the gospel and get in the way of what God has called us to do. In Philippians 1, Paul says this, some indeed preach Christ from envy and strife. Now, there were people that did, didn't like Paul in his day. Even though they were Christians, they became Christians. They didn't like Paul. They didn't like the way that Paul preached. They didn't like some of his doctrines or the way he would put it out there. And, and he understood that not everybody's going to agree. And he knew that some people were out to get him, even in the Christian community. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife and some also from goodwill, the former preach Christ from selfish ambition. So we know that there are those who preach Christ from a selfish ambition, not sincerely. So we also know there's going to be preachers that aren't sincere out there, supposing to add affliction to my chains. Paul understands what they're doing, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this, I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. And so what he's saying at the end of the day, that God is still able to somehow, through some of them, in some way, still draw some to himself. Somehow, some way. And that's the, that's the beauty of who Jesus Christ is and, and who the Lord is. That's the beauty. Now, let's finish reading this. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. I just want to make a mention right here that these things the, the, the disciples learned after Jesus was raised from the dead, they came alive inside of them. Sometimes, you know, our understanding of things sometimes don't happen until we go through something, until something happens and or to the end of something, when God just starts making his word come alive. But they believe the scriptures, and that's very important for all of us. If we want to get through this life right, we've got to believe the scriptures, no matter how we think about it. But it's also interesting, when Jesus said destroy this temple, he's using a Greek word that talks about the holy of holies, not the whole acreage of the temple. And so when he said destroy this temple, he said destroy this holy of holies. When they said 
you talking about this temple state is already taking 43 years. And they say that it took all the way to the year 60 something before it was actually completed. So this thing was always being worked on. And, the, and, and I heard and one of the commentators said there was at least 18,000 men always working on this, 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 this temple, Herod's temple for all these years. And so there's a lot of people there. There's a lot going on. But Jesus knew that he was talking about his own temple. But here's, here's what I want to get to is this is the year, the season of the Passover that Jesus is in Jerusalem. And Passover, it says in Exodus, seven days you shall eat, eat, eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leaven, leaven bre leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Look how powerful and, and, and direct this is. If you eat leaven or have leaven in your house, those seven days be cut off from Israel. You're no longer a part. Leaven is going to, we know, represent sin in our lives. And so it, during those days, the children would go on those hunt and look for the leaven. Everybody would go to the house to make sure there was no leaven in the house. They would cleanse their house. Well, Jesus is showing up, getting the leaven out of the temple. He's removing the leaven. He's doing exactly what the Passover talked about spiritually. is to get the things out of our lives that hinder us from fully grasping all that he has for us. Sometimes we hang on to these things that we shouldn't be hanging on to. And they keep us from fully embracing the Holy of Holies because you can't even go into the Holy of Holies with any leaven. You're not even supposed to have it in your house. Can you imagine going to the Holy of Holies with leaven in your pocket? You can't do it. You're not supposed to do it. In Matthew chapter 16, this is what Jesus said. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of leavened bread, you know, the, 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 what do you call it? The, uh, not real leaven, mm -hmm. spiritual leaven, you know what I mean? But of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the spiritual application. Even when Jesus said, tear this temple down and I'll rebuild it in three days, they, they just thought of the natural temple. There are so many things in the word of God that's, that's, that takes higher thinking, that takes higher understanding, that takes the Holy Spirit to give you the right kind of glasses so that you can see the truth in it. And if not, you're just going to see it on a practical level, on a basic level. And, and there is some okay sometimes to take something on a practical level. But in most cases, we're always supposed to say, okay, Lord, I get the practical. Take me to the next level. Like when the, the disciples remembered that his word said, zeal for your house is consuming. That's a psalm. And it's just one verse in, in, a, in a chapter with a lot of verses, but they remember that one verse applying to this one moment of Jesus' life. Look, Jesus is going to do thousands of miracles. We're only going to know about 30 of them, I think, 30-plus miracles in all four Gospels. He lived, you know, for three years doing miracles. So there's a lot that Jesus did that we don't necessarily get. So what he left for us, the things, that, the, the, the instances in his life that he leaves for us, it's for our learning. And he's telling us we need to clean the leaven out of our hearts. This day and age that we live in, it's uncertain, man. It's an uncertain day. And because it's an uncertain day, we should be, because you, you can look around and just, nobody knows what's next. Nobody knows what to do next. I'm going to tell you what to do next. What you do next is you hit your knees. You look inwardly. And you begin to purge out your own leaven. You begin to take the money changers out of your own heart. Take that whip to your own life before, you know, the plank in your own eye before you judge your brother. This is the day and age that we're supposed to be judging ourselves. We have no time to be looking around and judging anybody else. We're all going through this. We're all stuck here. I mean, it's get, it gets hard to rearrange the furniture and do it. I mean, and taking a net somewhere, place every day to do a video and CC and just, you know, trying to find the right. There's a lot going on in all of our lives to try to do what we can to just keep our head above the water spiritually and keep our head above the water and just being able to still have friends. I mean, I sneak a hug in every now and then. You know what I mean? I mean, you got to or you're going to die. And so you can sneak a hug in, sneak a hug in. 
But don't hug a net. That's what she said. Do not <laughs> hug a net. But as far as the rest of us go, what 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 I'm what I'm what I'm hearing the Lord say is to let's clean the leaven out of our own hearts. Let's let's, let's go within our own selves. In the meantime, when the innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And, and so in our day and age, we have to beware of doctrines that seem to keep us from God, keep us from the Lord. Uh, and so we just need to be careful for things that say that we have to add to the blood of Christ. And so we just need to be careful of all kind of leaven of, of Pharisees out there, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that not, will not be revealed or nor hidden that will not be known. The Lord has stopped every church in its tracks. Every church in its tracks has stopped, had to take a step back and reevaluate how they had to do church. I'm sure there were a lot of churches that were planning on doing an outside service and may still be able to do one. But then again, with the weather, you know, it can affect all that and change things up. And it, and it can be frustrating to do church. It can be frustrating to figure out how to keep the church going or keep the church's bills paid. It's stressful, but not for us. It hadn't been for us. Not because we're perfect or holy. We got all the leaven out. We're trying to start at the bottom, and we're working. We're, we're purging ourselves every day. We're, we're, we're looking for opportunities to just cleanse ourselves and to be different people during these times. But what we don't want to get into is entanglement of doctrines right now. Right now, it's time to help each other. Look what Paul says. It is actually reported there is sexual immorality among you and such, such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. Are you puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you? For indeed, as absent in the body but present in the spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such one to Satan. Why is he so harsh? Why is he saying deliver him to Satan? Because sin, man, the leaven of sin, can it, it corrupts the whole body. It corrupts everything. And if we let this stuff in our lives a little bit, it's going to grow into other people. Just like the sin of bitterness. Bitterness starts in one person and can spread and wipe out a whole church. Amen? We, we, we've all seen that. We've all heard of those things. I, I'm thankful I hadn't been nothing like that. But, but look what he says. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. It's saying, Lord, give him a disease. Give him something that makes him where he can't mess. Do that no more. Do something in his body that makes him realize he needs to repent. That's, what he, that's where I see sometimes people go to prison. My poor brother, we're praying for him to get out. But we also prayed him in there because we thought it was for his own good at the end of the day when we were watching him self-destruct as we do many family members. You don't want to see him self-destruct. So you make drastic measures. You figure out how to turn him over to Satan if that's what it says for the destruction of the flesh because you don't take your flesh to heaven anyways. It's a new body. So that, he, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Not your flesh, your spirit, man. So we need to take care of the leaven in our own lives before we start judging other people and judging other situations. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may, may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. <laughs> He's telling the whole church they're truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let's just be real to each other. Let's just love each other on a real level, right where we're at, in all of our unglory. And then we love each other into glory. We love each other up. We love each other into a holy place. And, and my love for you and your love for me maybe can help purge out your own sins. You know, as you take that inward look and you see what, what you can overturn in your life and, and get rid of. And, and remember that, that we're to be praying people. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now the works of flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, 
uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. God can't take that with you. You can't take this with you. So if you have any of these working in your life, it needs to be purged out. It needs to be called out into your, you call it out yourself. Somebody else doesn't need to call it out for you. This is the time that God has got us all at home trying to figure this out on our own sometimes. Between you and the Lord, it's hard to go out. Uh, who was at Home Depot yesterday? Oh my God. I went to Home Depot yesterday and it was, it was like everybody in Waco was at Home Depot. They have a pickup, I guess a call-in pickup over here. And every parking lot was full. People were coming and going, going down the wrong way. You couldn't get through. It was chaos, chaos. That's, that's the new norm for now, apparently. That's the new norm. Home Depot and Lowe's. Look, I know other people are going to see something different, but what I'm seeing is people nervously trying to stay busy. Nervously figuring, okay, I'll take care of stuff at my home, which is good. As you're home taking care of stuff, be home taking care of the inner stuff too. Especially as Christians, use these times to purge out the old leaven in your own heart and your own spirit. Because listen, we're getting closer. And if you can't see that these are signs of the times, you're not looking. Because these are, are signs around us. This is the Lord speaking to us. This is the Lord gently loving us into itself. Because let me tell you something. If you're listening to what's going on in the world around you, they're talking about, you know, tracking and tagging and following and controlling, controlling movement, controlling groups, controlling this. That sounds a little out there. It sounds a little 1984-ish, you know. With, what's his name? Orson Welles, whatever that thing was about. But here we are. And there's a lot of truth to a lot of these things that have been in cartoons, that have been in movies, and we're seeing it real in our lives right now, played out. And this is real life. And, and let me tell you something, real life brings real anxieties, and real anxieties can cause you to be sick. So I'm telling you, a lot of those anxieties come from uncertain things. But I'll tell you for certain, one thing that you can count on is if you'll get right here, Take care of these things that may be inside your heart. These, these things, these are leaven in, in your spirit and your heart. If you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, don't worry about it. Keep doing your thing. We pray God gets you. But for those of us who say we want to go to heaven, Jesus Christ is our Lord. These are the things that we cannot take with us in our, in our hearts. So what do we do with that? Look, I'm going to pray with you, but you have to pray. You have to, you have to connect yourself and go, man, Lord, you're ready to, to cleanse us. You're ready to purge us. You're ready for us to purge out the old leaven in our hearts, Lord. And so we're going to use this time. We're also going to pray for our brother Carl Zirkel. Many of you from church know Carl. He, he, we got a phone call this morning. He was unconscious. The ambulance was coming to get him. We've been praying for him this morning. And, um, we just want to lift him up, Lord. We just pray for Carl. We just pray, Lord God, that you just have your hand on him. Lord, during this time of loneliness and isolation, Lord, Father, we're having to live alone, Lord. We don't want to die alone. Lord, we just pray that, that you give us wisdom going forward and that you heal my brother, Lord. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that we know that he's in your hands always. And that's the safest place all of us can be. And I pray for those out there today, Lord, that if they woke up unconscious today, that they would be ready to meet you, Lord, if they were not to wake up tomorrow. And Father, I just pray that today we just, we just search ourselves and purge out our own temples, Lord, and get the leaven out of our own lives instead of worrying about pastors and big churches and pastors and mansions. It's not my business, Lord. But Lord, I thank you that you give me a zeal for you like Jesus had. And I can have a holy anger and I can get upset, Lord, in a right way. But I, I pray for wisdom, Lord, just going forward. And I pray for all my friends and family that are listening. And Father, that you just continue to keep us together. Just grow us as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I bless you.